<laughs> Hello everybody, welcome to episode 3 of Plaque Stage Pass, the accompanying series to Plaque to the Future, which by now you'll all be solid fans of, I'm sure. Um, today we're talking about all things Hertha Ayrton with Sophie, who is a young producer and who as I, I feel like she's not there. She's there for me. But f You're there for me as well, so... <laughs> We're talking to Sophie, uh, Sophie's a young producer, and she's also her Ayrton in episode three. Hello. How cool. Um, <laughs> and we're also speaking to Rebecca Higgett, who is the principal curator uh, of science at National Museum Scotland and is also a member of the Blue Plaques panel. The last couple of interviews I've done, I haven't really introduced people in a way that's as exciting as it should be, so I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves as well in a way that you're comfortable with <laughs> i don't mind who starts <laughs> i mean I'll, I'll go for it um i'm so i'm sophie um imogen said most of it but yeah i'm a young producer for shout out loud so i've got to be lucky enough to be involved in quite a lot of um the projects that you'll probably see on the youtube channel um and yeah this is one that's really interested me and i feel very honored that i got to be the voice for her threat and she's an interesting woman and i'm looking forward to yeah, finding some more out as we talk to Rebecca a bit more, so yeah. Um, and I'm Rebecca Higgett, I'm um, a curator um, of science at the National Museum of Scotland. Um, I started that job only quite recently, I worked at the university before that, so I'm a historian of science um, and I've had the pleasure of sitting on the Blue Flags panel for the last, I think, four years, um, which has been a fascinating series of discussions. Brilliant. Did, um, I can't remember when Hertha's plaque was awarded was that was that while you were on the panel was it no it was that? before my time actually um but yeah, okay. i think she's a shoe and i'm sure there wasn't too much discussion about her <laughs> yeah okay cool um well sophie as the guest you should ask the first question i think get things rolling get things rolling perfect so um we know from the first episode of um on Virginia Woolf that education for women in Britain was extremely limited at the close of the 19th century. Um, we were just wondering how easy you think it was for women to go down similar educational paths that, to Ayrton at the time um, and yeah was it, was it rare for women um, to get to the stage where she did um, where they could study subjects like science? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's worth saying it was rare for everyone um, in an era before universal secondary education, let alone you know, access to, to universities, widely speaking. Um, but yes, obviously for women, it was always harder um, than for men and, and for girls. Um, and in science particularly, which um, by this period was seen as being um, much more something that men would be likely to um, achieve in and something often seen as less suitable for women. But of course, this is just the moment where women really are pushing to get into higher education. You are getting um, uh, opportunities routes through um, universities, even if they couldn't yet get official degrees at Oxford and Cambridge, um, they could at London. Um, so if you were determined enough, if you had support, if you were wealthy enough, whatever it was, there was the opportunity for just um, a few women. For her threat, and it's particularly interesting that she comes from, you know, a reasonably um, unprivileged background, um, mm. Jewish immigrant family, um, not much money um, in her immediate family. So it's fascinating that she got as far as she did. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of um obviously we we learn a little bit in episode three about the, the many different inventions and bits of research that Hertha is involved in and, and leads. Um, was that quite typical for, for women in academic roles to sort of spread um, a, sort of across disciplines to try and help cement a, a more academic career? Um, not particularly typical, I don't think. I mean, um, it was hard to have an academic career, obviously, um, as a woman and, and the science careers didn't have a sort of straightforward um, path for, for anyone um, at this time. Um, so, you know, taking opportunities where you could was, was one option and women sometimes had more success when they went into areas that were less well established, less well studied, less prestigious, um, could sometimes find out a niche there. Uh, looking to inventions and patents might be a way of making money um, and obviously supporting yourself in a career like this was always going to be really difficult. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it was typical. Um, it's not particularly an academic thing to do to try and make money from your inventions. Um, but if you're not able to get a permanent job in a university, you certainly need to do that. I think for Hertha Ayrton too, there was um, 
she was keen to do things that attracted attention, that showed women were in these different places, had the ability to do these different kinds of things. So I think some of it for her is about that over the course of her career. Mm. Okay, I and mean, kind of expanding on from that, um, in in this episode in particular, um, the protagonist, Ada, um, the main character, she somehow managed to create a scenario um, where her is able to like to post um, one of the patented line dividers to Ada in the modern day. Um, and in through that um, process, she's able to learn um, like how the importance of being able to paint in your idea and um, receiving the credit and for the design and your own work. Um, and I suppose we're just wondering what the in the nineteenth century what the climate was regarding women, you know, securing their own ownership of their own designs and or anyone securing ownership, but in particular women um, in this in yeah, this era. Um, it's difficult often, um, and women. So, you know, patenting wasn't necessarily the sort of done thing. Um, you know, people sometimes hid behind their husband's name or initials, so it didn't look like um, it was a woman putting in a patent. Women certainly did patent things, and um, particularly more domestic items, um, clothing, um, furnishings, things like that. And that still is actually an area where women um, do put in, you know, significant numbers of patents. Because if you look at the number of women leading on patents, not so much in groups, you know, large group numbers of patents, but um, women as, as lead name on patents are still tiny, tiny percentage. Um, so um, things in some ways haven't changed that much. But um, before 1882, uh, married women at least couldn't own their own property, their husbands owned everything. Mm. So um, in the sense that there was no point in a, a married woman putting in a patent because she wouldn't get the benefit of it herself. Um, unless she had a supported husband and so on. Um, that had changed by the time um, her Theresa put in her first patent. There is also the um, problem of, of needing the money to put it um, in, and she was supported in that by her female friends, um, the sort of network of support that she had um, among campaigners, women's rights and, and suffrage, who were so key to the fact that she got the education and the opportunities that she did. Um, so yeah, it was a tricky thing to do. It was something clearly that those who were campaigning for women's rights were quite keen to, to okay. do, again, about promoting women's skills and abilities and so on. Um, so I think it was just the year after she filed that patent that Hertha Ayrton was able to um, put her um, dividers invention on display at an exhibition of women's industries um, to say that women were inventive and not only were they um, doing things like domestic furnishings but also mathematical instruments was something that they could do so I think um, it was again very important to make that that point um, and again her supporters were glad to be able to support her in, in doing that um, and um, oh, I was going to say something else but I've forgotten that oh yes I know um, the, the point in general about invention is that um, why they were so keen to put in patents uh, and say that women were inventive was because that was, was seen as something that women were not so there was this idea that you know women could be quite clever they could be perhaps quite good at calculating or synthesizing ideas um, teaching those sorts of things but that they weren't original in their thinking or weren't inventive that was seen as being men's sphere um, in general. So there was a lot of pushback um, from men when women were trying to assert themselves as able to do this um, and um, satire and so on, you know, sort of joking about women and their abilities going on. But that's precisely because women were at this period much more publicly doing that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was going to ask the next question just about like, just like other research that she did. But I just I just remembered that when I was looking at um, there, there was a document which was the sort of original file for, for patenting the line divider um, and it's got her her birth name written on it um so i appreciate i'm asking you this a little bit on the fly because I, <laughs> I didn't send you it prior to this interview but could you tell us a little bit about um her name change and the sort of yeah um why she did I, that? I I don't know the full ins and outs. Um, she was Phoebe Sarah Marks um, as her, her birth name. She seems to be known as Sarah quite often, although in that patent she puts herself down as Phoebe S Marks, um, which is, is quite a feminine name, I feel. You know, it's, it's really not high, she's certainly not using initials to um, hide her, her sex there. Um, she changed the name to Her Hertha because that was the nickname she got known by. I think one of her friends 
um, picked up the name um, from a poem, which I'm afraid I haven't read and I don't know the author, um, but it was obviously a poem with a, a heroine in it who was seen as, as being appropriate to, you know, the kind of person that she was or, or could be. Um, and that's just what she adopted. Um, Erton is her, her married name, um, her husband's name. Cool sneaky question in there. Now we'll just resume <laughs> the plan. Um, yeah, so um, obviously we've already talked about sort of how diverse her career was and some of the research that she did. Um, I, I just couldn't fit it all in to the 10 minute episode without it feeling like I was just reading a Wikipedia page to everybody. Um, so um, yeah, the, the work she did on, on searchlights and arc lights, um, I don't really touch upon. So I was just wondering if you could tell us more about the importance and the significance of that, that research. Yeah, I mean, I, I think really it's probably her most important work, actually, in terms of um, how it gave her uh, opportunities to get into kind of professional societies or, or get connected or have opportunities to read her papers at um, the Institute of Electrical Engineers, the Royal Society. It's what got her a medal, even if she was never allowed fellowship um, of the society. Uh, but um, it would also brought her in contact with her husband, um, who was obviously a very supportive person in her career. Uh, when she met him um, at the Frinsbury Technical College. So uh, electrical engineering as an area is one of those um, sort of of the moment. I mean, this is a period where um, electrification of street lighting is, is happening. Um, so there's lots of interest in it. It's um, perhaps not established enough as a field yet um, to mean that there aren't opportunities for some women, although it's clearly difficult. And I think it, it's the sort of public and scientific interest in that area that makes it good for threat and to sort of be seen to be doing this work and showing that she's, she's competent at it. Uh, so her work was mostly about um, electrical lighting, um, so arc lighting, which is very bright um, kind of electrical lighting that was being used um, from the mid 1870s. Um, some cities were getting that kind of electrical street lighting um, and it was also, it, it got replaced by incandescent bulbs sort of by the end of the century, um, but still got used for things like searchlights, um, lime lighting in, in theatres um, and um, other play, other sort of industrial uses where you need something very bright. So it was a bit harsh, a street lighting, it's really, really bright light. But one of the problems with it was actually, although it could be very bright, it was also quite inconsistent. Um, it flickered, it hissed. Um, so it caused a number of problems, particularly where you want a very steady, strong light. Uh, and so her research, um, building on, on stuff that her husband had been doing, um, William Ayrton, uh, who had advised on street lighting in several cities around the world, uh, was to look at why you got those problems of flicker and hiss and to work out the relationships. Um, she worked out an equation between the sort of length of the carbon rods that you need um, to create the arc. Um, the, the, uh, voltage um, that was um, being used and so on. So sort of trying to work out the different, you know, to give a scientific kind of set of advice about how to apply these um, technologies and um, to show that it was oxygen getting in contact with the carbon rods that caused those problems um, of flickering and, and the noise and so on. So um, to exclude that when you're um, creating uh, the lamp itself. So she wrote a series of articles on that. Um, was able to present her papers um, in these professional societies and um, by 1902 she collected her articles and um, published um, a book called The Electric Arc which was really the sort of standard work um, for, for that period of through to the end of the First World War um, so was an important and useful piece of work. I think it's amazing my brain is just not scientifically um like it doesn't work that way at all so to me it just sounds like this really cool thing I mean it is really cool but my brain just doesn't um compute it very well at all um in terms of how the stuff um that she managed to create and invent um one of the ones that we deal with a lot in the in the episode that we've done is the is the Ayrton fan um I mean there's a whole bit about trying to work out the the name of it and getting her to use it you know use her own name um and as we see it's obviously now known as the Ayrton fan um we it, Obviously, it's a vital piece of equipment that's that's been created, but it did take, you know, it took um, a year or so to get it greenlit to be um, used for the armed, by the armed forces. What was there any particular reason as to why kind of there was this there's such a such a delay? So I can't, <laughs> can't get my words out. Just <laughs> why? 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 Just why? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's in a way not that surprising. I mean, you're 
at war, um, the military is a big establishment, it can be hard to, you know, bring in innovations from outside while the military, you know, spends plenty on um, sort of research and development and technology. It's a major funder for science and technology. Uh, and certainly wartime is a time oh. where innovation is sped up. If it's coming from outside, that perhaps can be harder to get, get a hearing. But I think this is a lesson in how tenacious um, her federation was that she did keep pushing for this. She did manage to get it trialed. She did arrange production herself um, to get it in. The first trials were not that successful. Um, so that, yeah, I think, you know, the fact that um, those didn't go off that well, but she was then able to kind of come up with a redesign and, and get that tried and, and, and put on um, into active use as well, um, shows that, that she had good support and um, was able to make use of those connections that she had. Um, and was, was very keen to see this um, innovation come through. Um, I think there are questions about how how well it worked in practice as well. I mean, if we think about the kinds of situation, yeah. you know, when you're being gassed in a trench or on, in the yeah. middle of a battlefield, um, you know, the, there were differing views about how useful it actually was, but certainly mm. very much worth a try. And she had, you know, the kind of the physics behind it to kind of um, explain how it would work theoretically. And was there any recognition for for that work for her after the war? Um, no, not really. She, um, I, I mean, the recognition, broadly speaking, I suppose, was the point, again, that women can produce useful inventions, they have the scientific and te technical knowledge, they can support the nation during wartime and so on. So the sort of the long term um, goal of all of that was getting suffrage and that was achieved um, for women over 30 in, in 1918. So I think in a sense she got her prize for that. Um, she did think about applying um, for compensation um, after so there was a scheme set up um, that you could apply to after the war to kind of um, recompense people who had been doing work like this um, over the period. Uh, she then didn't in the end do that, I think, just because around that time there was some reports coming in um, from um, people. A Royal Engineer um, who had been involved said that it hadn't worked in practice and she may have just felt it wasn't worth, you know, kind of fighting that particular battle or it going through. A lot of her work was very much in the public eye, in the media. Um, she was publicising herself, women, the cause. Um, and um, obviously people were fascinated by her and, and what she did and they were fascinated by women who asserted themselves in general. Um, so it may have been that that was, was not the right particular sort of battle to be having um, in the pages of the media at the time where, you know, her eyes may have been on things like getting the suffrage rather than her own sort of um, money for this. And, and by that time she had sort of sufficient wealth through her husband, through a legacy that Barbara Bowes mm -hmm. her great patron, had, had left her. Um, so she perhaps didn't need it financially at that period for herself. I mean, obviously moving, like, moving on from that, like, a lot of the recognition she's got now is to do with um, her scientific discoveries and inventions and creations. Um, but as we've, as, as has come up quite a few times in this interview, that um, that women's suffrage was obviously a massive thing for her and um, she was very kind of a true supporter of it. Do we know more about the, any work that she did in particular for that, for the suffrage cause? Um, and also, like, I was just wondering, were there any links, were there any other links between kind of the suffrage movement and women in the scientific fields, which kind of Hertha seems to embody really? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, as has come up through this conversation, um, being able to show that women were capable and clever and um, all of these things um, mm. was part of the campaign. So I think in in a way, everything she did was feeding into that. So I think it was the real motivator. I mean, obviously, she you know was excited by the science she was doing as well. Um, yeah. But um, I think for her, the two things very much tied together. And yes, she was. Um, so on the one hand, it was integral to her career, um, having a network of women interested in education, women's education, women's rights, women's suffrage, um, there to support her um, financially, to put in her patents, to go to Cambridge. Um, all of these things. So um, that was absolutely part of the milieu. Um, and um, on the other hand, she was very directly involved um, with the work of uh, the Greek men of the suffragettes and the Women's Social and Political Union. So the Pankhurst, Emmeline Pankhurst, the leader of that, um, was someone she knew well. They um, went together to um, try and um, issue a petition to lobby the, the Prime Minister. Um, on the day that's known as Black Friday, which um, rather than gaining that audience of the Prime Minister, 
um, they were fobbed off and then there was quite a lot of violence um, in the street as well. So she was there, she said she um, was grabbed around the throat by two different policemen during that, um, although you know her daughter who was also a campaigner, um, Barbara, named after her, uh, Barbara Bojan, um, her, her uh, patron, um, and called Barbie. So um, <laughs> Barbie was there and um, she reported how she'd sort of shouted that and saying, you know, don't you know who that is? That's her threat and you better not lay a hand on her or, you know, it will be more shame wow. to you. Um, mm-hmm. So she could use her sort of fame in different ways um, as yeah. well. So yeah, she was absolutely there. She um, helped out in the period of the Cat and Mouse Act. So that was when mm-hmm. the Liberal government um, would arrest women, um, keep them in prison. Um, they would go on hunger strike um, to sort of keep the eye on, on their um, sort of suffering and, and their campaign. Um, they would then release them when they were too weak and it was getting dangerous so they could kind of recuperate and, and sort of eat and, and then bring them back into prison um, after to, you know, to complete their sentence and a uh, pretty uh, cruel sort of business. Um, so she was part of, um, you know, hosting women, um, including Christabel Pankhurst, um, uh, during that period. Um, I think she helped secure some funds which would have been seized by the police otherwise from personal accounts when people went in prison and she sort of made sure that was um, put somewhere safe. Um, so she had quite an, an active role um, in all of those things um, and um, kept campaigning during the war as is um, suffragettes, um, WS, um, whatever it is, Women's <laughs> Social and Political Union, um, ceased campaigning in the war. Um, there were other groups who, who carried on um, and um, they were, you know, important in keeping the message in, in the public eye and in the government's um, eye. And so were, you know, important to making sure that that um, act went through in 1918 and, and some women got mm. the vote and continuing after that to making sure that eventually after her death, um, women got equality in the vote. I think it's amazing just how involved she was. I'm going to, I'm just going to swap the questions around just because I think this is more up now, but um, t- talking to you now, um, is hearing about how much she's been involved and quite everything that she got, you know, she got, got up to, it kind of amazes me. And then obviously as well with the science, scientific side of things, is actually how like unrecognised she is now in comparison to some other like famous historical figures. Um, I mean, obviously she's got the blue plaque and she's getting recognition here, but I mean, I'll be honest, I hadn't heard of her before mm. this project and I wish I had but she didn't come up in kind of curriculum or on kind of on there's no like tv shows or in anything like the public history field she doesn't seem to come up that often and it kind of yeah do you, why do you think that might be that she hasn't kind of got that much recognition it's interesting I mean, it's actually looking over this um reminded me again how famous she was at the time actually so it's interesting okay. that she sort of you know kind of slipped out of sight um and is as you say very much i think coming back into view um mm. in the last few years with various um plaques and sort of prizes and buildings and institutions and so on um, named after her which is is great um i think though people don't have very much capacity to remember a lot of, of names if you know yeah. what I mean um, if you if you ask people to name famous scientists you get sort of Newton Darwin and Einstein yeah. and that's it you ask people to name um, a female scientist they might manage Marie Curie who is someone that, that Ayrton was, was friends with um, but it, it's quite hard to push them beyond that um, mm. often so um, if we think about plaques to other women, um, I think Ada Lovelace is one that um, mm-hmm. people perhaps, again, has, has you know, come into quite a lot more recognition lately. Um, but Kathleen Lonsdale, recent plaque, I don't know how well known she generally is. So she was one of the first two women to become a fellow of the Royal Society. Yeah. Um, Agnes Arbour um, and Rosalind Franklin. So there are lots of names of women who could be better known um, yeah. than they are. Uh, and. I think, yeah, we, we have the opportunity to, to talk about these people more now and bring them back in. Um, but yeah, if we think about, you know, how textbooks are written and so on, you sort of draw on the sort of the obvious examples and um, many, many stories get missed yeah. out, unfortunately. I think we should petition the BBC. She can be the new, the, the next big historical drama series. That comes I mean, out, yeah, <laughs> like there's plenty to go on. I think. Yeah, so I mean, just like, can, yeah, yeah. There was just like this this line that I just loved putting into Black to the Future, where she was just sort of 
casually mentioning how involved we, she was with with the suffrage movement and just like oh yeah no i, I nurse them in my lounge when they come yeah. out to, to sort of um, rehabilitate and um yeah it's just yeah. it sounds what, like your... this amazing network of just legends yeah. really yeah that uh, all absolutely and, and she also has her laboratory at home you know so That's crazy. Um, she's not someone who has an institutional position so she's got you know sort of the six suffragettes on one side and a um arc lamp experiment going on on the other which is extraordinary i think yeah a drama is definitely the way to go yeah that that would just i think everyone would find that interesting i mean yeah yeah like what a room to be in in the lounge yeah. just like yeah. perth and the pankhursts like just oh my yeah. god just just got off the phone with mary curie like <laughs> legendary yeah, crazy you got the big names <laughs> yeah yeah um and i think sorry i was just gonna say no, i think yes. she i mean um i think she might be someone who's a little bit hard to kind of bring into the science curriculum although you know definitely a, a yeah. good person to um, mention you know where sort of literacy has been covered or something like that but she would be a super example for for the suffrage um if, if you're people yeah. doing that in history so people hear about the pankhurst perhaps but many other campaigners from all sorts of different walks of life are, are not and i think showing how sort of broad that was and talking about that link between education and suffrage and science and i sort of didn't quite answer your question there but um many women who were trying to get a scientific education or who were working in science or yeah. in medicine particularly so this is also a time where women are just becoming doctors um and many of them were suffrage campaigners which is not surprising when you think about you know kind no. of trying to have these opportunities and so i mean by no means all um but but yeah they were a very significant part of of that whole campaign yeah did you want i don't mind who asked the next question sophie because i know that we're into like you're we're into like sophie's fun questions now and i don't want to take credit for them because they're like a little bit more exciting than okay um we'll go for the um what would what would you say is your most interesting slash unknown fact about her threat and, and the way i kind of couched that was something you wouldn't find on the wikipedia page um, i don't know if that makes sense um <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think the Wikipedia page covers the fact that she founded the Fire Brigade um, at her college, um, or at least mentions it. So I think that, that's quite a cool fact that is quite um, cool, yeah. <laughs> about her. Um, what else? Um, she, um, well, yeah, the, the very obvious things about her will be well known, like being the first woman to, to read a paper at the Royal Society um, in 1904. Um, I think Wikipedia doesn't cover the fact that um, before that, in 1899, she had performed her experiments at one of the Royal Society's soirees, um, so an annual event with you know lots of people coming along in black tie um, and enjoying that. And so she was um, the first woman to be at that, not as a guest, but actually performing her own, you know, and presenting her own work mm. there. Uh, and I think that got a lot of media coverage again. Um, and people were just fascinated to, um, reporters, male reporters were fascinated to know what this kind of creature of a female physical scientist might be, you know, what, yeah. what was she like? And they, she was often described as being eccentric um, and, you know, not always particularly politely um, when they were saying that. Um, she dressed um, in sort of pre-Raphaelite clothing, um, so kind of quite loose uh, robes and so on, which was part of the, um, a kind of reform movement, sort of trying to sort of free women from more restrictive um, kinds of dress, which in the 1880s, you know, it could certainly be. So I think that's, again, so this, this whole um, sort of person that she was kind of presenting um, herself as this sort of more emancipated woman, um, but also then the kinds of criticism that that got and sort of immediate, mm. even obituaries afterwards, people were, could be quite unkind about her. Um, but you know, good honour, and we can really appreciate it now. Yeah, as I asked the question, I mean, you just said some really cool things as well. But as I asked, it, I was like, and I don't know what can beat, you know, having suffragettes and scientific discoveries <laughs> all in one living room. To be honest, I don't know if that's on the Wikipedia page, but that just is like the pinnacle. Thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, many what things you could say, definitely. <laughs> yeah, um, and as for some reason, my other fun question as well, as Imogen says, they're fun anyway. Um, is We've already answered as well, but in what ways would you most like her story to be told um, in the public history arenas, whether it be museums, curriculums, podcast TV? But I mean, we've already said that a BBC drama should be the way to go. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I'll definitely go with that. I mean, I think, um, you know, she's brought in, in other things. There's only so much you can say. I mean, you were saying yeah. you ran out of um, space to um, put in, you know, all the sort of scientific work she did. And if we think about her whole life, um, yeah, I think I think. Uh, 
um, a full a film that would be um, appropriate for her, definitely. I think um, whatever it is and wherever it is, I think what I'd like to emphasize um, would be this thing about networks and how important they are um, mm. for, for anyone. But if we look at women who had scientific careers, particularly at this period, but you know, long after as well, because it, it you know, today it remains um, something that's harder for women to do. Although, you know, plenty of women take science degrees and so on, but it's harder to sustain a career um, over time. Um, but particularly at this period, having the networks of family, of friends, of supporters, of, yeah. um, you know, women's groups um, was so important. And then Essen herself then played an important role in sort of helping other people and sort of showing, you know, this was the direction you could go. Um, founding the National Union of Scientific Workers and so on to kind of, you know, get that sense of solidarity. So I think emphasising her as part of a network would be really nice. Yeah. Yeah, that network aspect really, really came through in the research and um, yeah, just the, the support she had to obviously get into the educational establishments and then also the the support she was giving people like, like Marie Curie, who we've mentioned, you know, saying, no, you should be taking credit for this. And um, yeah. yeah, just like, a, it just sounds like a really nice group, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah like this is sort of like... <laughs> a cool original Avengers sort of thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe they should cool. just rebrand Marvel <laughs> as like that. She was clearly quite quite fearless in terms of, you know, getting yeah. up and, and speaking for, for herself and for other women particularly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, usually I, I let our young producer guest ask the last question. But I mean, you've just run through all of your fun I questions, have, yeah. Sophie, so I, I might take this <laughs> one for myself. For uh, you know, in the spirit of having ownership for what you come up with, I'm going to ask the last question. Um, so, Rebecca, if you could be on a phone call with her for Ayrton, calling straight into that living room, oh my gosh, uh, what would you ask her or tell her? Um, I think... The things I would tell her um, would be, well, something about where we are today, but also the fact, you know, how, how long it took. So the fact that, oh. you know, she won that Hughes medal um, in the early 20th century from the Royal Society. One other woman has won one in, since then, wow. and that was in the early 21st century. So um, the things like that, the fact that, um, you know, it took decades for another woman to become a member of the um, Institute of Electrical Engineers. Um, it took yeah. decades before women were allowed to become fellows of the Royal Society. Um, it was, you know, what happened after her death in terms of women getting equality in the vote. So that might all be a bit of a downer, um, but I think it would be interesting to, to talk about that and to sort of get her thoughts and sort of advice on, you know, how to kind of continue the struggle as it were. Um, I'd love to have a chat about how she sort of understood her successes, you know, what would she put it down to? Um, how do, how would she interpret it? You know, in terms of mm. um, its uh, sort of place within science, but also within um, sort of socially, um, you know, what that work did and so on. So um, a chat about that, and then more happily, I could tell her, you know, all the things more recently that you know the recognition that she her name now has, um, and hopefully that would that would cheer things up a bit. I think that's yeah that's most the people sort of that, we, that I've spoken to previously have said oh I'm not sure I would tell them anything but I think yeah with Hertha she deserves to sort of know sort of what's yeah. what's come out of of her work even if it even if it did take her a little bit too long mm. um yeah so that's yeah. that's good <laughs> that's cool um what was that Ugh, I'm not doing that again um <laughs> Yes, but um, thank you, Rebecca, for speaking to us about Hertha today. Yeah. Um, really one of like one of the people that we focus on that there's just so much more yeah. to uncover. Um, and I feel like we're still only just below the tip of the iceberg. I there's feel there's like a lot more work to be done, I think. Yeah, there's, a, there's yeah. some articles, but yeah, there's, I think, you know, a full modern biography, more research. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. can inspire someone to do that. That would be fantastic. Go out there and do it, guys. Um, yeah. And thank you, Sophie, for, for joining Pleasure. me and being a, uh, the most wondrous co-host. And I also for it. being her Ayrton, who, yeah. you know. More I, of my I voice. hope you enjoyed that. I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> to be her person for a while. I felt, I felt pressured to, like, yeah, to do it justice, do it justice. Um, but I hope 
yeah i couldn't find i tried like look, looking up videos but if, you, if they were like voice recordings of her you know sometimes you can get mm. those and i was like there was just nothing mm. and i was like i'm gonna have yeah. to just free will this and just hope for the best i think she'd approve i think she'd approve if you just being like she's probably like this um yeah. <laughs> but yeah thanks thanks to both of you thank you guys for thank watching you. um we're pre-recording this so i don't know if anybody is watching it but i really hope really hope you are I'm sure they um are. <laughs> Yeah. Um, don't forget to join us next time on Plaque Stage Pass, uh, where we'll be speaking about John Archer, who was um, a politician, um, and also obviously the next episode of Plaque to the Future, which just so happens to be about him as well. It's like we've planned it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. See you next time. And thank cut. You. Thank you for using iconophone. Do not mention war. Do not indicate date. Do not allude to mortality.